This video is going to discuss the rigid rotor and its application to pure rotational spectroscopy. So the rigid rotor is a simple model in quantum mechanics that's used to model molecular rotation. So what we're thinking about here is a, something like a simple diatomic molecule that's rotating freely in space. This molecule isn't interacting with anything, there's no reason it prefers any one orientation over another, and we should essentially just think of it as a free rotor. And so the Hamiltonian here will have the kinetic energy associated with the rotation, but there's not going to be any potential energy. It's not interacting with anything else. In addition, we're going to assume that that bond is rigid. In other words, that the bond length does not change. That's what makes it the rigid rotor. And so our Hamiltonian here looks like the in angular momentum squared over two times the moment of inertia. This is a lot like the particle in the box, where you could think of the Hamiltonian there as being the linear momentum squared over two times the mass of your particle. Here, for a rotating body, the moment of inertia takes the place of the mass, and we have angular momentum instead of linear momentum. But this is very much analogous to the particle in a box, except, of course, we have no walls in this system. It's rotating freely throughout space, through all angles, theta and phi, in three dimensions. If you expand out the full Hamiltonian, you get the expression you see here. Now, when we solve the rigid rotor, we end up with a series of wave functions which are known as the spherical harmonics. These wave functions depend on the angle theta and phi, and they have two quantum numbers, j and m. j ranges from 0, 1, 2, etc., while m ranges from 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, all the way up to plus or minus whatever the current value of j is. And now the functions have various forms, but I've shown two example ones here for the y11 and y1 minus 1 functions. You can see they involve normalization constants in front. In this case, it's a sine theta, and then an e to the i phi or negative i phi, depending on whether m is 1 or negative 1. We also get energy levels, ej, which equals h bar squared over 2i times j times j plus 1. Two things to note here. First, we often, for the ease of use in spectroscopy, lump the constants h bar squared over 2i into a single constant, b. Second, the energy levels don't depend on the quantum number m at all. So in fact, we get a lot of degeneracies in the rigid rotor system. Each state, j, has 2 times j plus 1 fold degeneracy. So here's what an energy level diagram looks like. For the j equals 0 state, we have only one possible m value, m equals 0. For the j equals 1 state, m can still be 0, but it can also be plus or minus 1. So we get a total of three possible states for j equals 1. For j equals 2, it can take anywhere from m values of 0, plus or minus 1, or plus or minus 2. So we get a total of five degenerate states. At j equals 3, we get seven possible degenerate states. Now this pattern actually might look familiar because this looks a lot like the s, p, d, and f orbital patterns you know from atoms. So we have something s-like here with one orbital. We have three of these which are like the p orbitals, five at the j equals two which are like the d orbitals, and seven in the j equals three which are like the f orbitals. And in fact, these same spherical harmonics will pop up again when we look at the hydrogen atom. The other thing you'll notice is that the energy spacings are not uniform. Now this picture isn't drawn to scale, but the point is if you look at this energy model, you'll see that as j gets bigger, the spacing between the levels, say for example the spacing between j equals 0 and j equals 1, is smaller than the spacing between j equals 1 and j equals 2, and so on. The spacing is going to get larger and larger the higher in j we go. Now let's talk about spectroscopy. So for the sake of making the spectroscopy discussion easier, I'm not going to show all the different M states. I'm just going to show the J level. So we're ignoring the degeneracy just so we can have simpler pictures to look at. So here are my different possible J states. I've listed the energy of each of these. So J equals 0 has energy 0. J equals 1 has energy 2B. 6B for J equals 2. 12B for J equals 3, etc. And I got these by just plugging in different possible J values into our energy expression there. Now, if we're going to do spectroscopy, we have selection rules. First off, the molecule must have a permanent dipole moment. Second, we can only jump from one state to the next state. So delta J has to be plus or minus 1. We can't skip over states. So our transitions are only between adjacent states. So looking at the different possibilities, you can see that our transitions look something like this. We can transition from 0 to 1, which has an energy of 2B. We could go 1 to 2, which has an energy of 4B. Or 
2 to 3, which has a change in energy of 6b, and so on. We could also go 3 to 4, 4 to 5, and so on. So all these different possible transitions have slightly different energies. They're all even multiples of b. Now it turns out that the energy levels for rotation are small relative to the amount of energy that's available at room temperature. So what this means is that room temperature will typically have many different rotational states populated. And so we can, if we do a spectroscopy experiment, we can excite molecules from each of those different possible rotational states. So we'll see quite a few different peaks in our spectrum. So for example, this is a simulated rotational spectrum I have drawn down here, but I'm showing that we would see peaks at many different frequencies. We'd see one peak at 2b, which would correlate to molecules from j equals 0 being side up to j equals 1. We'd see a peak at 4b, which correlates to those in j equals 1 being side to j equals 2. One at 6b, which correlates from j2 to j3, and so on, other higher peaks depending on which states are actually populated. Now depending on those populations, you might see differences in intensities of some of these in a real spectrum, but I've just drawn them all as equal intensity for simplicity here. The other thing you'll notice is that the energy spacing between these peaks is always 2 times b. So this actually makes life easy. You can, for example, try to fit this spectrum by just looking at what is the difference between the peak positions in each of these different ones and try and fit those values to 2b. The reason that's useful is the b constant is related to the moment of inertia from our earlier slide, and that moment of inertia is related to the bond length. So once we know b, we can actually solve for the bond length, and this is a way to experimentally measure how long the bond is in a diatomic molecule. Now the rigid rotor model isn't perfect, its molecules are not perfectly rigid, so you can improve the rigid rotor model by accounting for centrifugal distortion, that is how the bond stretches as the molecule rotates. Now that's a problem you can't solve exactly, so you have to use approximate techniques, but if you do so you find a correction to the energy levels that looks like this, where our energy states um, are look like the normal rigid rotor energy states, B times J times J plus 1, plus a correction, which in this case is minus d j squared times j plus 1 squared. So we call this d the centrifugal distortion constant, and it slightly decreases the energy levels, energies and the spacing between those levels. Now d is typically much smaller than b, several orders of magnitude. So for example, in HCl, b is 10.4 wave numbers are roughly, while d is only 0 0.0004 wave numbers. So this correction, this centrifugal distortion correction, tends to be pretty small. It doesn't have a major effect. But if you're trying to do high precision work and solving for a bond length for, or geometry, you might want to consider these factors. Finally, here's an example of an experimental microwave spectrum. So microwave spectroscopy is synonymous for rotational spectroscopy because the t transitions occur in the microwave region of the spectrum. And so as you you would expect, based on our earlier discussion, we see multiple transitions in the microwave spectrum, in this case for CO, corresponding to different initial and final J states. So we see all these different peaks. Um, in this case, the rotational constant B is just a little bit less than two wave numbers, and so we expect uniform spacing of around two times B, or just under four wave numbers here. And if you stare at the x-axis on the scale, you will see that the gaps between peaks are about four wave numbers. So you could go ahead and fit B to the spectrum and solve for the bond length of CO. Other interesting feature you'll notice is there are these smaller peaks here. These correspond to peaks from minor isotopes. So the major isotope and the main peaks on the spectrum are from the carbon-12 oxygen-16 isotopomer. However, we of course also have oxygen-18 isotopes and carbon-13 isotopes, and these smaller peaks correspond to um, rotational spectra from those less common isotopes. Because they're less abundant, they occur more weakly in the spectrum.